to you hey, once again. Good and to be back, Gary. Every time we get together, good things happen. <laughs> and we're going to talk uh, about a, a book that, that you, has just come off the press, and, and the title of it is Final Fire. And the question that I just asked is the subtitle. Is the next Great Awakening right around the corner? Well, is it? Obviously, to have had this book come out in print right at the same time that Donald Trump was elected, I had to have been thinking about this over a year ago. Uh, But his election, I think, has confirmed some of what I was already feeling, and that is conditions. If you study Great Awakenings, this book does that. It goes through the first, second, third, fourth uh, Great Awakenings. There are repeatable circumstances that seem to precede every Great Awakening, and one of those is when society, when our culture begins to lose faith in government institutions uh, and then they turn back to God. You know, they, we've heard this our whole life, right? When things oh, sure. are really good uh, and the, you live in an entitlement society, you're, you're more likely to pray, dear government, give us this day our daily bread than you are Absolutely. to necessarily require to have faith in God uh, because times are good, right? So people forget how to pray. Remember, um, at 911, remember how church attendance suddenly spiked and I, went back up? I do. And that's part of human nature. You know, whenever we think that things are falling apart and we're not sure who's in control, we want to go to a higher power because we need to know that if things get out of control, we've got somebody we can drop to our knees and say, help, right? That's right. <clears throat> uh, and, uh, but with the Brexit vote in Britain, it illustrated that you know the common man out there is losing faith in the ideas of global, globalism. They're becoming um, kind of an, um, almost anti-government, or at least anti-government trust. So seeing that, and then over here in the U.S., watching what was going on with Donald Trump and wondering why Trump was gaining in popularity when he wasn't necessarily a polished speaker. Right. He wasn't a politician. He doesn't have any experience. Uh, and it seemed to, I seemed to see an echo in that of what even happened when I was young and we went through the Jesus people movement, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, back to Donald Trump for a moment, it, it, he uh, got a lot, a lot of uh, uh, publicity when he went to uh, Liberty University and the subject of Christianity came up and there was a, a great debate about whether this man was actually a Christian or whether he was just pretending to be. But it brought up the subject of Christianity within a, a political sweep of sorts. And that hasn't happened uh, in my lifetime. It, it, to me that was a remarkable series of events. And and I go back in my mind also to the Jesus movement on campuses. I remember uh, Bill Bright Campus Crusade mm-hmm. years ago, as I'm sure you do. And today, uh, thinking back on that and looking at today's campuses by comparison, how different uh, are the times in which we live? Yeah, uh, scary actually what's going on on the campuses today. Right. And frankly, uh, I told somebody the other day, I think with the Trump election that God put his finger on the pause button. I'm not sure that the average American even understands how close we were to a precipice that definitely could have resulted in a great deal of, well, let's just call it what it is, persecution against the church and against the church's uh, ability in this nation to be able to operate uh, at sure. will, to hire and fire who they want, not to have government mandates that uh, that establish policies that might work against their conscience, uh, their freedom of expression. So, uh, uh, But we have been given this opportunity. And, and it, it also did remind me of the Jesus People movement in another way because I was a hippie. Now, you see this here now? <laughs> At one time, this hair hit me down here. Wow. It did, yeah. How times change. Oh, and how times change, right? <laughs> and, uh, uh, but uh, I remember, you know, with the Jesus people, how Jesus himself was like the coolest guy on earth. Why? Because most of those people were anti establishment. Again, this issue of right. anti establishment, distrust in the government. Remember, it was the Vietnam War. Woodstock with Country Joe McDonald said, you know, don't ask me why we're fighting, right? But the next <laughs> stop is Vietnam. Oh, my God. Uh, and, um, uh, and so they're marching on Washington, D.C., and Nixon is sending the water cannons out to push them back, but they just keep on keeping on. Um, well, once, the, you know, the way people are wired, 
Uh, we want to be submitted to a sovereign. God put that in our hard wiring, right? To keep us wanting to know Him. To that keep God-shaped us, vacuum. Yeah, that God-shaped vacuum, as they say. And when people turn away from government, they're going to turn back to God. So that's part of what happened in the Jesus movement. But that was also reminiscent of what we're seeing now, I think. So many people across this nation feel a void. They feel like something's missing. They no longer trust that the government can uh, provide for that deeper yearning. And that is one of the significant seeds of every great awakening in the history of mankind. The circumstances were different, but in essence that was what happened. They, they, they were hungry for something more, the government couldn't feel, fill it, and so people turned back to God. Now you just used the term great awakening, and I'm looking at the table of contents uh, of your new book, uh, Protestant Reformation, First Great Awakening, the Second Great Awakening, the Third Great Awakening, the Age of Fire, the Fourth Great Awakening. And then you go into a revival and possibilities for, for revival. In a way, this is a history. It is. Uh, it, it, and by the way, I enjoyed it as a history because I needed to be refreshed on uh, the, the ancient revivals. Uh, and I want to talk about that for a minute. Uh, we read uh, about these revivals, and it, they almost seem too good to be true. Uh, s- suddenly, in a, a small town or at a small church, uh, two people gather, then four, and then eight, and then sixteen, and first thing you know, a whole village, and then a state. Uh, how do these things happen? Well, sovereignty is definitely a part of this, meaning that none of those great awakenings happened as a result of some big evangelist, you know, organizing a bunch of events and saying, okay, boys, we're going to have a big awakening. Um, At best, some of them, like Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield, they played a role. They were Mm -hmm. men who were at the right time, at the right place, and they obeyed a calling, but still sovereignty was in control. It was a moment in history. It was a moment in time where people turn back to God. You read the book of Judges, and over and over, and Israel forgot the Lord their God, and went whoring after idols, and and blah, blah, blah. And then what happens? God allows sometimes harsh circumstances. They, They go into captivity, or there's a famine, or there's a war. Something happens, and it triggers a act of repentance, right? Mm-hmm. Second Chronicles 7.14, if my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Interesting that he, he includes that I will heal their land saying that there's both kind of a social, cultural, political kind of part in this awakening in that it will also influence law. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, and uh, Now, you mentioned, for instance, the age of fire. This yeah. is another thing we should point out on this program is that sometimes awakenings were born out of very harsh circumstances, like the book of Judges that I just mentioned. Mm-hmm. You take the Second World War, for instance, yeah. and, uh, you know, the church was pretty much asleep in the 1940s, right? The war's going on. The United States doesn't even want to get involved with it until finally they kind of get drug into being you know, participants in this war. We didn't have mass media then, and most of the world was unaware of exactly how terrible uh, the circumstances were at Dachau, at Auschwitz, the ovens, the number of Jews that were being uh, burned to death just for being Jews, selective right. persecution, right? selective extermination. But what happened then was when the realities of World War II became public knowledge. Uh, all around the world, Zionism, which you know existed before the end of the war, but it never got its legs under it. You know, yeah. the idea that we're going to have a Jewish state, all the Jews were dispersed all over the world. Uh, Zionism finally got its legs under it because people felt sympathetic, right, mm-hmm. to what had happened to the Jews in the Holocaust. And so pressure was put on the United Nations, it was put on the United States, it was put on Britain. They began calling for a Jewish state. And then what happens? 1948, a miracle, right? A miracle. A nation <clears throat> is born in a single day. But what happened to the church? So here you have terrible circumstances, but what happened to the church? Suddenly the church saw what they believed to be the budding of the fig tree, Matthew 24. And they believed that that generation will not pass away until all these things are fulfilled, right? 
that yes. they suddenly prophecy. Nobody was thinking about prophecy, no. hardly anybody in the 40s, right? All of a sudden prophecy, the rapture, the great tribulation period, they believed the imminency of the second coming of Jesus Christ was at hand and it started a fire. That's why they call it the age of fire, right? Sure. And up out of that comes the tent meetings, the, the tabernacle meetings, A.A. A. Allen. By the way, I gave testimony in A.A. A. Allen tent meetings in Phoenix, Arizona when I was a younger man, right? Along with R.W. Shambach. Can you believe that? Uh, that's uh, but, amazing. But William Branham, Billy Branham, uh, Catherine Kuhlman, Billy Graham, Oral Roberts, everybody com- comes up out of this with this belief that the second coming of Christ is imminent, what we do we must do quickly, right? It was an, a kind of an urgent moment. And of course the age of fire not only gave birth to tens of millions of people getting saved and coming into the kingdom of heaven, but to this day our theology is influenced by it, Western Baptist Theological Seminary, so much grew out of that. And then right as that revival was starting to slowly wane, bam, comes the Jesus People movement and another awakening kind of right on the heels of it, and yet it's coming from a totally different place, right? This was mostly just anti-establishment guys thinking that Jesus was cool. Absolutely. And he was cool because he was a revolutionary right. in their minds. And on campuses there's always this revolutionary spirit. Uh, our generation is going to do things that nobody else has ever done before, right? Right. right. Yeah. So you have uh, a cyclical kind of development. Uh, Israel, 1948-1967, you had the Six Day War uh, and you had Jews standing on the Temple Mount and saying we're going to rebuild the Temple. Mm-hmm. That lasted about 24 hours, but right, right. but uh, and then just a few years later, Hal Lindsey, the late great planet Earth, uh, and then you had the campus uh, crusades, and you had the development of uh, modern um, uh, prophecy-oriented evangelism, mm-hmm. and now uh, that's becoming slightly controversial. Uh, they're saying, oh, you, you people have been preaching imminency now for years and years and years. That's getting tired. It's getting old. Not to me it isn't. Right. But are we looking for another fire? Well, I, I think though even the idea of imminent, imminency, I think that's getting ready to be reborn as well. If you look at the rabbis uh, in Israel now and what they're saying about the election of Donald Trump, right? Yeah. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that um, you know, the, it, one of the rabbis over there has pointed out that his name, the gematria, the numerology of his name actually means Messiah, right? Yes. Uh, I don't think they're saying he is the Messiah, but they're saying I think that he's uh, like John the Baptist. He is the forerunner. You know, his appearance signals the coming of Messiah. Although there certainly could be rabbis who are maybe suspicious that Donald Trump could be the Messiah. Now, why would I say that? Because they don't think of the Messiah the way we do. Uh, you know, we we Jesus is our model of the Messiah, so we think of God in flesh, divinity, things like that. The ancient Jewish idea of the Messiah was a king, the anointed one who was to come and 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 most of the time he's a guy that's going to win decisive battles, mm-hmm. right? Against the Romans in the case of, of the Messiah in that day, they wanted a Messiah to come back stand up against the empire. Right. Yeah, that's what they were looking for. Well, so now they would look at a guy like Donald Trump. When you realize where we've been for 8 years as the United States, which has always historically been in modern times Um, Israel's best friend, right? And for good reason. And I think God has blessed us because that has been historically our position at least since World War II. Uh, and uh, But that has been waning in recent years and there has been cause for concern, right? The two-state pressure being placed uh, through the United Nations with the U.S. kind of, you know, standing more on the side of the Palestinians against. Now all of a sudden that's changing. You've got a guy who was just elected who has said, I'm going to do away with the Iranian deal. I'm I'm one state solution guy. Israel's never had a better friend. And and let me just ask a question at that point because uh, uh, Donald Trump has already said that he wants to move uh, the embassy of Israel and he wants to call it the state of Israel, move the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Fighting words. Uh, Why would he do that? Uh, The inauguration is still days away. 
And yet he's already making these very assertive statements. And this is getting the Jews' attention. It is. And actually, now there, there's, there's a little something else going on here with uh, this one reference to his name meaning Messiah. But there are others, several rabbis actually in recent days have said that the election of Donald Trump signals the coming of Messiah. But don't forget, you and I did shows. You know, I wrote that book, Zenith 2016, which yes. you have in your store. Yes, indeed. Uh, asking, you know, why were there all of these ancients uh, talking about the year 2016? Actually, specifically 2012 to 2016, right? Right. And uh, I had sent all you guys an email back around 2009 uh, on a different discussion, and I got some feedback that said, hey, Tom, have you ever looked at the Zohar? So now you have... Probably, it's probably the most important book of Jewish Kabbalah, uh, Jewish mysticism, written 700 years ago in, in primeval uh, Aramaic, right? But in the Zohar, what do the, what do the rabbis say? They say that in the, in the uh, subsection called Signs Heralding Meshach, they say uh, in the year 5773, which was in October of 2012 through to September of 2013, Messiah will make himself known to the rabbis, right? And sometime after that he'll start making himself known to the world. Well, 5773, where's Donald Trump? He goes to Israel, he visits with the rabbis, he goes on public television telling people to vote for Benjamin Netanyahu and the Likud party in the general election, right? Does that on public TV. And from that point and forward, he's continued to talk about his support for Israel. Mm -hmm. So I think they saw something in him, a, poli a potential political figure who could be a forerunner of Messiah. Well, 300 years ago, another rabbi, Meir Horowitz, uh, studying Daniel's time, time, and half a time, uh, determines that in the year 5777, right, Messiah will actually appear. And this, of course, 5777 is the year we're in right now, uh, from October of 2016 mm -hmm. through September of 2017. That's right. It's a very, very important year to most all rabbis. And so I think the timing of some stuff around this election has them pretty excited. Now, when you start, if you study what the Jews are looking for in a Messiah, not only a political figure, not only will he take a strong military uh, stance in, in support of Israel, but uh, the Jews from around the world will begin in gathering. So note that from his election, several rabbis have said Jews around the world need to start moving into uh, Israel now because the Messiah is here and he's about to make himself known. They also believe that the uh, uh, Messiah will reinstitute the temple services. So what did they said last week? We want uh, 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 Donald Trump. And then another uh, rabbi said Trump and you know, the leader of Russia, Putin, to come forward now and start putting pressure on the, through the United Nations to build the third temple. So they are literally saying things in which they're revealing that they believe, I mean, I can't imagine they think Trump is Messiah, but they definitely think he's Messiah-like. He is Messianic. Uh, and that everything he is doing is opening potentially this door for the arrival of Messiah. Now I want to hastily add uh, that we do not believe uh, that the Zohar has scriptural authority on right. par with the Bible. No. But, but on the other hand, we're looking through Jewish eyes. Right. To Jewish intellectuals, they are being given clues to, to the times. And of course they're very interested in this for a number of reasons. Number one, the, the enemy is growing stronger and stronger all the time around Israel. Uh, and the enemy is calling for a two-state solution, right. which is the next step to totally dissolving the nation. And I think all the Islamic countries understand that. So th there is a crisis looming. And they're looking everywhere they can look to see uh, what in the world is going to happen? And wouldn't you know, 5777 just happens to be this year. Right. And the Zohar, which is their book, again, uh, I'm not recommending it as no. spiritual sure. material at all. It is important to them, though. But it is important to them. And so here we find ourselves in a spiritual crisis, if you will. From the Jewish perspective, from the Christian perspective, I think Christians were this close 
uh, had had the election gone uh, in another way, mm -hmm. to having a real challenging time ahead. Right. Well, one final thing I'd add about the, the Donald Trump messianic connection: they're also looking now into his bloodline, because remember, through some of the Irish and and European. Uh, kings and dynasties, yeah. they spent great deal of time tracing their bloodline back to the Davidic dynasty. And uh, so now they're looking, and, and they do know that Trump is certainly you know, from the bloodline of some of that European royalty. So is there also a connection there? I mean, these people are looking at this. They're examining it to find out, right? Uh, if maybe he's not the one, is he the forerunner? Because remember like with John the Baptist, he's in prison. They send people, are you the one or should we look for another? Mm -hmm. And he has to tell them, I'm not the one, I paved the way for the coming of one who is greater than I. That's fascinating. And by the way, you uh, cover these things very well in your book. It's called Final Fire. I'll tell you how you can get it in just a moment. But Thinking back as you're speaking to the time of Jesus, there was great ferment in the land uh, and the rabbis were looking for their leader mm -hmm. to come. Right. They didn't exactly know how he was going to, to come and when he did they missed uh, as was in the plan, I think God's master plan. But on the other hand uh, the timing was in our eyes discernible. That is to say certain things were happening happening societally which almost seem to be repeating themselves right now. Right, and that's the whole point about us drawing analogies from the rise of Trump, the unlikely uh, fact that he would be elected, and for over a year I've been saying to my staff, this reminds me very much of what was happening that did lead into the Jesus People movement. And that's why I mm. said it reminds me of that. And I think it's a, it could be a sign that we are moving towards another um, great awakening. I also believe that this is this generation's uh, Ronald Reagan moment. Because when Reagan was elected, I remember all of us preachers, we couldn't believe it. You know, we, we knew that there had been other U.S. presidents that, ha that said they were a Christian. But nobody... Nobody ever acted like Ronald Reagan. He's going to the big prayer conventions and speaking, yeah. and he's being pro-life, and he's talking, you know what I mean? Absolutely. He even talked about prophecy. He talked about Russia uh, in light of biblical prophecy. We had never seen anybody like that, but now all of a sudden we have a guy, you know, Billy Graham says, give him a break, he's a baby Christian, you know, <laughs> so yeah, he's, yeah, he's yeah, a rude, yeah. crude <laughs> dude, right, or whatever. Right, yeah. uh, but, uh, and you know, time will tell, but certainly he is surrounding himself with spiritual advisors, and some of his uh, early picks for his cabinet appear to be super conservative, and he's certainly going to also play a role in influencing the Supreme Court. Now we didn't talk about the danger of dominionism and we need to be careful not you know, to put our faith in a political figure because that's what's going to bring the Antichrist to power when religious people give their, you know, their, their service, if you will, to a political figure. But certainly it can influence the environment that is conducive to the preaching of the gospel. Well my eyes just uh, fell on the back cover of your book. <clears throat> it says, in final fire you will learn how God used simple men, women, and youth of the past, quote unquote, un unqualified by human or finite standards. He used them to irreversibly change the world. You know, that's, that's a great story. Yes. That's, that's where it's at. Yeah, it absolutely is. I mean, people, when they read this book, they're going to find out that the most unlikely people were part of it. Little, and kids, sometimes nine, ten-year-old kids literally preaching for hours through which thousands of people gave their life to the Lord just because they were in that moment and they were anointed. I have my Bible open to Acts chapter 2 uh, and uh, where Peter is uh, uh, quoting the prophet Joel, it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Uh, talk about that a minute. Yeah, well, so if you, you know, that text, if you look at it, it says some very key things which we go into in here. We make predictions, for instance, that women are going to be involved as preachers. Why? Because that's what it says in the Word of God. He's going to pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. Uh, we believe that young people will be too, and young people have a role to play. And think of the technology that we have now. 
you know, we, you, you carry your iPhone around with you that has more power than the <clears> gigantic <throat> building-sized computers that put man on the moon. And you can tweet to thousands of people. And they can people. tweet to thousands of people. Donald Trump's also using that too, isn't he? <laughs> he is his own syndicated <laughs> press, right? All right. Uh, but they can blog and they can make YouTubes and they can talk to people around the world. And now through translation uh, systems, we're also able to communicate with people in other languages. We, we, we really have now all of the tools necessary to fulfill the Great Commission, to take the gospel literally to the ends of the earth. And that's the final prophecy, right? Yeah. And, and then shall the end come. Goes back to Daniel, you know, he said many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. If we're not there, I don't know where we are. Right. It is increasing right. exponentially. <clears throat> the book is called Final Fire by Tom Horn. Is the next Great Awakening right around the corner? Uh, you can have this book for 1995. Go to Prophecy Watchers uh, online bookstore, go down then you'll find Tom Horn and uh, a bunch of things right there including Final Fire. Uh, Tom has also written another book and I'm excited to talk to you about this one. We're going to do it on another program. It's called Abaddon Ec- Ascending. What's it all about? Mm-hmm. Abaddon Ascending. Who's Abaddon and how is he ascending? <clears throat> this book's available also for 1995. Uh, both books, uh, 39.90. And by the way, with both books, which we're calling the Final Fire Package, uh, you'll get the uh, two DVD set called Inhuman, absolutely free. So together, all of these would be a $65 value. And I think that's great for you because you'll learn a lot. In fact, if you've been listening to Tom in the last few moments, your head is spinning right now. That's the way Tom is. You, when you start, you don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate you. I learned from the best of them, Gary. Well, you know, we are living in about the next 20 seconds or so in exciting times. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I would say to people to study what is uh, Peter's famous sermon here, because he also talks about there will be signs in the heavens, uh, this, you know, the sun and the moon. Uh, yeah. Some of the blood moons came just ahead of this right. political season. Uh, sure. Yeah, and... Uh, so we also, though, talk about signs such as angelic manifestations. How many people know that in the book of Revelation a mighty angel is going to appear in the heavens and begin preaching the gospel to Whoa, the world, right? You, you got my attention. But we're going to have to stop because we're out of time. We'll be back with more of Tom Horn. I'm Gary Stearman. You keep watching. We are. See you hey, once again. Good to be back, Gary. Every time we get together, good things happen. <laughs> and we're going to talk uh, about a a book that, that you, has just come off the press and, and the title of it is Final Fire. And the question that I just asked is the subtitle. Is the next Great Awakening right around the corner? Well, is it? Obviously to have had this book come out in print right at the same time that Donald Trump was elected I had to have been thinking about this over a year ago. Uh, but his election I think has confirmed some of what I was already feeling and that is conditions if you study Great Awakenings, this book does that. It goes through the first, second, third, fourth uh, Great Awakenings. There are repeatable circumstances that seem to precede every Great Awakening. And one of those is when society, when our culture begins to lose faith in government institutions. Uh, and then they turn back to God. You know, they, we've heard this our whole life, right? When things oh, sure. are really good. And, uh, and that you live in an entitlement society, you're, you're more likely to pray, dear government, give us this day our daily bread than you are Absolutely. to necessarily require to have faith in God. Uh, because times are good, right? So people forget how to pray. Remember um, at 911, remember how church attendance suddenly spiked and I, went back up? I do. And that's part of human nature, you know, whenever we think that things are falling apart and we're not sure who's in control, we want to go to a higher power because we need to know that if things get out of control, we've got somebody we can drop to our knees and say help, right? That's right. <clears throat> uh, and, uh, but with the Brexit vote in Britain, it illustrated that, you know, the common man out there is losing faith in the ideas of globa- globalism, they're becoming... 
um, kind of an, um, almost anti-government or at least anti-government trust. So seeing that and then over here in the U.S. watching what was going on with Donald Trump and wondering why Trump was gaining in popularity when he wasn't necessarily a polished speaker, right. he wasn't a politician, he doesn't have any experience, uh, and it seemed to, I seemed to see an echo in that of what even happened when I was young and we went through the Jesus people movement, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, back to Donald Trump for a moment, it, it, he uh, got a lot, a lot of uh, uh, publicity when he went to uh, Liberty University and the subject of Christianity came up and there was a, a great debate about whether this man was actually a Christian or whether he was just pretending to be but it, one of the significant seeds of every great awakening in the history of mankind, the circumstances were different, but in essence that was what happened. They, they, they were hungry for something more, the government couldn't feel, fill it, and so people turned back to God. Now you just used the term great awakening, and I'm looking at the table of contents uh, of your new book, uh, Protestant Reformation, First Great Awakening, the Second Great Awakening, the Third Great Awakening, the Age of Fire, the Fourth Great Awakening. And then you go into a revival and possibilities for, for revival. In a way, this is a history. It is. Uh, it, it, and by the way, I enjoyed it as a history because I needed to be refreshed on uh, the, the ancient revivals. Uh, and I want to talk about that for a minute. Uh, we read uh, about these revivals and it, they almost seem too good to be true. Uh, s- suddenly in a, a small town or at a small church uh, two people gather then four and then eight and then sixteen and first thing you know a whole village and then a state. Uh, how do these things happen? Well sovereignty is definitely a part of this meaning that none of those great awakenings happened as a result of some big evangelist you know organizing a bunch of events and saying okay boys we're going to have a big awakening. Um, At best some of them like Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield, they played a role. They were Mm -hmm. men who were at the right time at the right place and they obeyed a calling but still sovereignty was in control. It was a moment in history, it was a moment in time where people turn back to God. You read the book of Judges and over and over, and Israel forgot the Lord their God and went whoring after idols and and blah blah blah. And then what happens? God allows sometimes harsh circumstances. They, They go into captivity or there's a famine or there's a war. Something happens and it triggers a act of repentance, right? Mm-hmm. Second Chronicles 7.14, if my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Interesting that he, he includes that I will heal their land saying that there's both kind of a social, cultural, political kind of part in this awakening in that it will also influence law. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, and uh, Now you mentioned for instance the age of fire. This yeah. is another thing we should point out on this program is that sometimes awakenings were born out of very harsh circumstances like the book of Judges that I just mentioned. Mm-hmm. You take the Second World War for instance yeah. and uh, you know the church was pretty much asleep in the 1940s, right? The war's going on. The United States doesn't even want to get involved with it until finally they kind of get drug into being, you know, participants in this war. We didn't have mass media then, and most of the world was unaware of exactly how terrible uh, the circumstances were at Dachau, at Auschwitz, the ovens, the number of Jews that were being uh, burned to death just for being Jews. Selective right. persecution, right? Selective extermination. But what happened then was when the realities of World War II became public knowledge. Uh, all around the world, Zionism, which you know existed before the end of the war, but it never got its legs under it. You know, yeah. the idea that we're going to have a Jewish state, all the Jews were dispersed all over the world. Uh, Zionism finally got its legs under it because people felt sympathetic, right, mm-hmm. to what had happened to the Jews in the Holocaust. And so pressure was put on the United Nations, it was put on the United States, it was put on Britain. They begin calling for a Jewish state. And then what happens? 1948, a miracle, right? A miracle. A nation <laughs> is born in a single day. But what happened to the church? So here you have terrible circumstances, but what happened to the church? 
Suddenly the church saw what they believed to be the budding of the fig tree, Matthew 24. And they believed that that generation will not pass away until all these things are fulfilled, right? Yes. They, they suddenly prophecy. Nobody was thinking about prophecy, no. hardly anybody in the 40s, right? All of a sudden prophecy, the rapture, the great tribulation period, they believed the imminency of the second coming of Jesus Christ was at hand and it started a fire. That's why they call it the age of fire, right? Sure. And up out of that comes the tent meetings, the, the tabernacle meetings, A.A. A. Allen. By the way, I gave testimony in A.A. A. Allen tent meetings in Phoenix, Arizona when I was a younger man, right? Along with R.W. Schambach. Can you believe that? Uh, uh, that's but, amazing. But William Branham, Billy Branham, uh, Catherine Kuhlman, Billy Graham, Oral Roberts, everybody com- comes up out of this with this belief that the second coming of Christ is imminent. What we do, we must do quickly, right? It was an, kind of an urgent moment. And of course, the age of fire not only gave birth to tens of millions of people getting saved and coming into the kingdom of heaven. But to this day, our theology is influenced by it. Western Baptist Theological Seminary, so much grew out of that. And then right as... Brought up the subject of Christianity within a a political sweep uh, of sorts. And that hasn't happened uh, in my lifetime. To me, that was a remarkable series of events. And And I go back in my mind also to the Jesus movement on campuses. I remember uh, Bill Bright Campus Crusade Mm -hmm. years ago, as I'm sure you do. And today, uh, thinking back on that and looking at today's campuses by comparison, how different uh, are the times in which we live? Yeah, uh, scary actually what's going on on the campuses today. And frankly... Uh, I told somebody the other day, I think with the Trump election, that God put his finger on the pause button. I'm not sure that the average American even understands how close we were to a precipice that definitely could have resulted in a great deal of, well, let's just call it what it is, persecution against the church and against the church's uh, ability in this nation to be able to operate uh, at will, to hire and fire who they want, not to have government mandates that Uh, that establish policies that might work against their conscience, their freedom of expression. So, uh, uh, but we have been given this opportunity. And and it it also did remind me of the Jesus People Movement in another way because I was a hippie. Now, do you see this here now? (laughs) At one time this hair hit me down here. Wow. It did, yeah. How times change. Oh, how times change, right? (laughs) And, uh, uh, but uh, I remember, you know, with the Jesus people how Jesus himself was like the coolest guy on earth. Why? Because most of those people were anti-establishment. Again, this issue of anti-establishment, distrust in the government. Remember it was the Vietnam War. Woodstock with Country Joe McDonald said, you know, don't ask me why we're fighting, right? The (laughs) next stop is Vietnam. Oh my goodness. Uh, And uh, and so they're marching on Washington, D.C., and Nixon is sending the water cannons out to push them back, but they just keep on keeping on. Um, well, once the, you know, the way people are wired, uh, we want to be submitted to a sovereign. God put that in our hard wiring, right? To keep us wanting to know Him. To that keep God-shaped us, vacuum. Yeah, that God-shaped vacuum, as they say. And when people turn away from government, they're going to turn back to God. So that's part of what happened in the Jesus movement. But that was also reminiscent of what we're seeing now, I think. So many people across this nation feel a void. They feel like something's missing. They no longer trust that the government can uh, provide for that deeper yearning. And that is that revival was starting to slowly wane. Bam! Comes the Jesus People movement and another awakening kind of right on the heels of it. And yet it's coming from a totally different place, right? This was mostly just anti-establishment guys thinking that Jesus was cool. Absolutely. And he was cool because he was a revolutionary in their minds. And on campuses, there's always this revolutionary spirit. Uh, our generation is going to do things that nobody else has ever done before, right? Right. right. Yeah. So you have uh, a cyclical kind of development. Uh, Israel, 1948-1967, you had the Six-Day War, uh, and you had Jews standing on the Temple Mount and saying, we're going to rebuild the Temple. Mm-hmm. That lasted about 24 hours. But, right, right. But, uh, and then 
just a few years later, Hal Lindsey, the late great planet Earth, uh, and then you had the campus uh, crusades and you had the development of uh, modern um, uh, prophecy-oriented evangelism. Mm -hmm. And now uh, that's becoming slightly controversial. Uh, they're saying, oh, you, you people have been preaching imminency now for years and years and years. That's getting tired. It's getting old. Not to me it isn't. Right. But are we looking for another fire? Well, I, I think, though, even the idea of imminent, imminency, I think that's getting ready to be reborn as well. If you look at the rabbis uh, in Israel now and what they're saying about the election of Donald Trump, right? Yeah. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that um, you know the, it, one of the rabbis over there has pointed out that his name, the gematria, the numerology of his name actually means Messiah. Right. Yeah. Uh, I don't think they're saying he is the Messiah, but they're saying I think that he's uh, like John the Baptist. He is the forerunner. You know, his appearance signals the coming of Messiah. Although there certainly could be rabbis who are maybe suspicious that Donald Trump could be the Messiah. Now, why would I say that? Because they don't think of the Messiah the way we do. Uh, you know, we we Jesus is our model of the Messiah, so we think of God in flesh, divinity, things like that. The ancient Jewish idea of the Messiah was a king, the anointed one who was to come, and 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 most of the time, he's a guy that's going to win decisive battles, mm. right? Against the Romans, in the case of, of the Messiah in that day, they wanted a Messiah to come back, stand up against the empire, right? Yeah, that's what they were looking for. Well, so now they would look at a guy like Donald Trump. When you realize where we've been for eight years as the United States,